Well, welcome everybody and uh, indeed we're going to talk about uh, TypeScript. So yes, my name is uh, Sander Mack. I work for Luminous Technologies. Um, we're a software company in the Netherlands and we uh, specialize in creating scalable and modular architectures uh, using Java. So we build a lot of our backends uh, using Java, uh, also using OSGI as a modularity uh, techn technology. And uh, the last few years, uh, we've all noticed the shift at the client side from uh, heavy server-side view rendering frameworks to HTML5 clients using JavaScript in a browser to actually create a single page application. So when that shift happened, um, uh, we actually also adapted it. That means we uh, built a lot of our systems using uh, RESTful backends and uh, having JavaScript enabled clients on the front end. So this of course means that uh, the, the amount of JavaScript that you're writing uh, keeps growing and growing. Uh, whereas it used to be just a little bit of JavaScript to uh, spice up your applic application page. Um, yeah, currently, uh, in a lot of our applications, the client-side code in JavaScript, or now we use TypeScript, but it, it used to take up uh, a large chunk of the code of your application, maybe even half of your code base. So I subtitled this presentation, Coding JavaScript Without the Pain. And I guess um, if you're a Java developer, then doing JavaScript is pretty different. Um, not only is the language completely different uh, because, uh, yeah, it's just a whole different language from Java, but it also has a lot of different qualities. And um, we're going to look at it today. In the agenda, I'd like to introduce uh, the arguments that we used at least to select TypeScript over JavaScript. And after that, I'll give you uh, an introduction to the language using some uh, live coding examples. And of course, there are many al alternatives to, uh, uh, to TypeScript as well. So we'll look at a few of those in the end of the presentation. And afterwards, uh, we'll wrap it up. And uh, if you have any questions, like Ina said, uh, you can uh, leave them in the uh, uh, WebEx application. And we'll have a look at them as well. So I was talking about JavaScript and how it's so different from Java. Now, different doesn't necessarily mean uh, worse, but in the case of JavaScript, there are a few aspects of the language that really make it, uh, at least in our opinion, an inferior experience to uh, developing Java. So one of the most important aspects uh, that is different is the fact that uh, unlike Java, JavaScript is dynamically typed, uh, meaning that um, actually at runtime and at code time, uh, different things can happen. In Java, when you make a type error in your code, the compiler will uh, easily uh, uh, warn you for it, and even before your code has run, you will have to fix the error. Well, in JavaScript, not so much. If you make an error, uh, you will trigger it, hopefully, uh, when you run the actual code. And it even depends um, whether you actually trigger the path that has the incorrect, incorrectly typed code. So, uh, it, it doesn't read, really need much uh, expansion on that. Uh, that's, that's something that doesn't work very well. On the other hand, uh, Java, and at least how we use Java, uh, also combined with OCI, offers us a lot of um, uh, constructs to actually modularize code. So of course, we have classes, we have packages, we have all kinds of um, information hiding uh, um, principles that we can apply using these uh, constructs. And in JavaScript, actually the only kind of scope that you have is the function scope. Now, that's not really very, uh, very much. And actually, um, in our experience, that's not enough to actually create uh, modular front ends. So there are workarounds um, and there are, are patterns that use the, the fact that you can ha uh, only have function scope. And they try to create a, sort of an illusion of modules in, in JavaScript. And there are also patterns like uh, the immediately invoked function expressions, the iffy. Well, if you ask me if you have to uh, name your pattern iffy, then something is seriously wrong with your language. Um, so these patterns, while they're very useful and many JavaScript developers know about them, they're not actually uh, nice to work with. So for us, uh, you can summarize the situation as JavaScript just really scales badly. Um, and scaling means both in the coding sense, but also in a team effort sense. And um, part of that is the fact that you cannot really 
uh, enforce modularity, separate modules, have clear interfaces between modules, etc. All the things that we take for granted in Java uh, aren't available in, uh, in, uh, in JavaScript. So, of course, that's the bad side. But why would you even stick with JavaScript? Because there are many alternative client technologies as well. But I think that's an easy sell as well. Um, JavaScript is just everywhere. All browsers support it. Um, all major uh, applications today are mostly web applications built uh, on, on top of this JavaScript stack. And because of that, there are a huge amount of libraries available. Um, and it's, again, it's a very flexible language, which is both good and bad. Uh, it's good in a sense that in the front end, uh, yeah, you often uh, need a little bit more flexibility, at least in my opinion, than in the back end. Uh, I mean, we can all remember the days uh, of writing uh, Twin code in Java. Um, building GUIs in Java isn't really great either. So, on the one hand, this fle flexibility is nice. On the other hand, uh, it does hamper uh, our productivity. So, can we find a sort of a, a middle in this road? That's the question. So, when we started to look for alternatives to just doing plain JavaScript development, uh, this is uh, sort of our wish list that we created. Like I said, we create HTML5 uh, JavaScript enabled uh, clients and we wanted to find a way to do this in a more scalable and a more modular fashion. That does mean uh, probably uh, that Java developers on our side would have to uh, get involved in the front end as well. So one of the uh, uh, yeah, first things that we looked at is Okay, what alternatives are also easily gra graspable and learnable for Java developers? And the solution that we wanted to pick should be non-invasive. It should be native to the web. It shouldn't be something that's completely uh, different like, uh, like Flash, for example, does or Adobe Air does. They need a comp completely different runtime even. Uh, you need plugins in your browser, etc. That's a really a no-go. So, and with non-invasive, I also mean that we should be able to leverage exist existing JavaScript libraries in whatever solution we were going to pick. Now, this is all technical arguments, um, but of course, if you're going to uh, pick a different language or a different technology stack for your front end, you also need something that is uh, actually supported by uh, lots of people, by a big community or a big company. And uh, it shouldn't just be uh, some, some one-off uh, GitHub repository with a single enthusiastic uh, person. So this is also something that we always weigh in when we uh, look at technology. And last but not least, uh, if we were going to adopt a technolo technology, a different language that compiles into uh, JavaScript, um, I want this JavaScript, this output to be clean and easily uh, relatable to um, by developers. And why do we want this? Well, what if this long-term vision that I talked about for the language, like for example uh, TypeScript, what if it doesn't pan out? What if it's a failed experiment? Then we can always take the uh, JavaScript that was output by, uh, by the TypeScript compiler or by any other compiler that compiles to JavaScript and take this as the basis for the rest of our development. But then you of course need clean and idiomatic JavaScript code on the output. Well, it probably doesn't surprise you that um, TypeScript uh, hits all the marks on this wish list, and we'll see in the remainder of this presentation uh, how it does that. So first, let's get this out of the way. Yes, TypeScript is a uh, project by Microsoft, formerly known as the Evil Empire, um, and does that make us uh, worry about it or not? Well. I would say Microsoft in the past few years has shown a great commitment to, uh, to open source and they've really changed the way how they interact with the community as well. Um, and TypeScript is really a great example of that. If you look at the TypeScript uh, repository, it's actually hosted on GitHub. It's licensed using uh, an Apache 2 license, so it's, it's very, very usable in uh, all of your projects. And actually the TypeScript compiler itself is hosted as a uh, node module on the node uh, uh, package manager uh, site. And one really uh, uh, important thing for me as well is that uh, this guy, uh, he's called Anders Halsberg, is actually involved in the design of the TypeScript language. 
he's also responsible for uh, lots of different uh, great languages. Uh, he's also involved in C sharp, etc. So there's a really bright guy working on this language alongside uh, a lot of other uh, bright guys from Microsoft. And it all happens in the open on GitHub. So on that part, uh, we're actually very, very uh, happy with this uh, situ situation. And I wouldn't say it's really uh, something to hold against TypeScript. So what is TypeScript? The language itself is actually a superset of JavaScript, which means that any uh, valid uh, JavaScript uh, file is also a valid TypeScript file. And what does TypeScript add in the superset? Well, one of the most important aspects is that it adds a type system to JavaScript. And this is not just a fully checked, completely covering, uh, statically, uh, static type system, but it's actually an optional type system, which is a really nice and convenient way to uh, incrementally uh, allow for type information to be added to, uh, to JavaScript. And uh, in the example I'll give later, you uh, actually see how you can grow a JavaScript file from completely untyped to completely typed and checked by the TypeScript compiler. The TypeScript compiler itself uh, can output JavaScript uh, suitable for both the ECMAScript 3 and 5 uh, runtimes. Now, uh, if you select the 3 version, you can actually target all the browsers. If you target ES5, you will uh, be able to run the uh, resulting code on all current modern browsers. So. Um, this is actually what we are doing in, the, in our production code, uh, targeting ES5, and it's, uh, it's working really well. Now, the nice thing about TypeScript and its compiler is that it uh, only works at compile time. So, you have TypeScript code, you run the compiler on, on it, and out comes JavaScript code. But this JavaScript code uh, doesn't depend on any runtime library for, for TypeScript or anything. So, at runtime, it's just JavaScript, and uh, you can just... Uh, yeah, use it like you would use any other JavaScript code. So we've been using uh, TypeScript for about uh, a little less than a year now. And in April of this year, uh, the first production release was, uh, was made by Microsoft. Uh, the 1.0 version was then uh, released. And one of the cool things um, about TypeScript is that the features that they add to JavaScript uh, as part of the superset that they uh, have uh, on top of JavaScript, uh, aren't actually made up out of thin air, but they're aligned with the feature features that are coming in the next version of JavaScript, uh, called ECMAScript 6. So there are features in TypeScript like classes, interfaces, and we'll see all about them. And these are all inspired on the uh, specifications of the next version of the JavaScript language. And what this means is that you have a really nice uh, path to the future, so to say. You can actually already use these ECMAScript 6 features, even though uh, most browsers do not fully support uh, these features yet, because you have the TypeScript compiler and it compiles uh, these features down to just plain ES3 or ES5 code. So, for us, TypeScript was really a, a lightweight productivity booster, in the sense that it's uh, not invasive to add to your project, and it really gives you, both through the optional type system and the other features that I mentioned, classes, interfaces, etc., uh, really, really nice tools to do uh, yeah, uh, more productive development on the client side. So what do you need to do if you want to get started using TypeScript? Well, you need the TypeScript compiler. And like I said, it's hosted on NPM, the Node Package Manager. So if you have Node.js installed, you can um, actually invoke npm install minus g TypeScript. And what you could do is take your existing JavaScript code, uh, rename it to .ts, making it develop TypeScript, because TypeScript is, of course, a superset, a superset of JavaScript, and then compile uh, this uh, TypeScript file. And even if you don't have any TypeScript-specific features in this, uh, this file, TypeScript comp compiler may already found, find problems with the uh, JavaScript that you've written. And I'll show an example of this. But this already shows that having uh, compile time checking of your code obviously is better than just running your code in the browser and then running into the problems. So let's start with the most important feature of TypeScript, the uh, optional type system. So what 
uh, TypeScript allows us to do is to, uh, instead of having the plain uh, JavaScript that we have at the top, uh, is to add type annotations. So in the JavaScript, uh, for example, we could have a variable A, and we assign it 1, 2, 3, which is a number, and we try to call a method trim, which is actually only available on strings and not on numbers. So when we call this trim, then at runtime, uh, the browser or the JavaScript runtime will give us a type error and say, say, okay, undefined is not a function. It can find this trim function, of course. So what could you do in uh, TypeScript? Well, you could say, okay, I expect this variable A to be a string by giving the colon string. And then, of course, if you initialize it with another value, in this case, a number and not a string, then the compiler will at compile time warn you and say, cannot convert number to string. So even before you run the code, uh, you will see the error and you can fix it. Now, of course, this is a very trivial example. And uh, if these lines uh, are uh, uh, adjacent in the source, source file, you will probably catch it. But these errors can, of course, be, be very far apart. You can have a variable decoration that's used uh, hundreds, of lines of later, uh, hundreds of lines later, and then uh, you wouldn't be uh, able to easily spot these sorts of uh, issues. So, this is adding type annotations. The nice thing about TypeScript is that you cannot just, uh, cannot only um, uh, add these annotations by hand. Uh, the compiler also can infer types for you. So in this case, if we uh, have the TypeScript uh, on the right, which is again this variable A, and we assign it uh, one to three, the number, then the compiler will infer that the type of A is number and it will actually give an error on the second line where you call a.trim and it will say, okay, the property trim does not exist on the value of type number, which is true because trim only exists on things of type string. Now, you might be wondering uh, what happens to this type information uh, once the compiler uh, has emitted the JavaScript code. Is it still there? No. At runtime, the uh, actual type information disappears uh, from the code. So this type and this optional type system is really only used uh, at compile time by the compiler to help you find errors in your code quickly. So what kind of types do, we, do you have? Well, as Java developers, uh, it's really uh, not a very surprising mapping that, uh, that happens between uh, the types that we know in Java and the types that are available in TypeScript. So you have uh, sort of a, a top level uh, a type in Java that would be object, and in TypeScript it's uh, any. Uh, void and void uh, are both uh, valid types for uh, methods, re return uh, values for methods in TypeScript. Boolean maps to a Boolean. Now JavaScript doesn't have any uh, distinction between integers, longs, shorts, etc. It's all just a number, which is sort of uh, a float implementation in JavaScript. And since TypeScript is a superset of uh, JavaScript, it doesn't change that. So it also has uh, the number type, which actually represents both integers, shorts, longs, etc. And then uh, the string characters that we know from Java, and there's only a single string type in, uh, in JavaScript, so uh, also TypeScript also has this uh, single uh, string type. And arrays uh, work in the same way as they do in Java, just using the brackets that we, uh, that we know. So that's a lot of talking about TypeScript, so I think it's nice to actually go and see some code. And for that, I'm going to uh, switch to the TypeScript Playground which is a uh, part of the TypeScript website where you can actually interactively uh, try out TypeScript without installing anything. It's just a website and you can just uh, code there. By the way, all of the examples that I'm showing and even a bit more than that are available at the uh, URL on the bottom of this slide. So if you want to look at that uh, later, then uh, that's possible as well. So I'm first going to share my browser with you so you can see the TypeScript playground. There it is. So what we have here is on the left uh, an input box where you can enter our TypeScript code and it will be automatically compiled um, in the browser to TypeScript and that will be output on the right. So what I have here is a little snippet of just plain JavaScript because uh, like I said 
it's very easy to start with uh, JavaScript and incrementally transform it into types, TypeScript. And we're going to do just that. So what I tried to do is try to implement a function find by name. And as input, I have to give a name and I have to give some elements. And the elements are listed here. So I have uh, three JavaScript objects with a name and an extension. And what I want to do is I, I want to find the right object in this list by the given name to the search function. And I want to do this in a case insensitive way. Now, if I want to call this function, I can already see that the TypeScript uh, playground and by that the TypeScript compiler can give me some code completion. And that's because the uh, compiler knows everything about the code that's, uh, that uh, we're actually editing now. By the way, TypeScript itself is implemented in TypeScript, the compiler. Uh, so it's also, uh, it, it, it compiles down to JavaScript and that's why it can run in this browser environment. So if I just call my find by name method with a single argument, which would be totally fine in JavaScript, because in JavaScript, that would just mean that the uh, runtime environment would call this method using Java as the first argument and undefined as the second argument, and then it would just crash and burn at runtime. Now, in this case, um, the TypeScript compiler actually already gives me uh, an error. Even though this was valid JavaScript, it's not valid TypeScript because it's not well typed. Um, we're not actually calling the um, method with enough parameters. So it does say, okay, you still need to give a parameter for the elements. And there I can just provide the array of languages that I just uh, gave. But it, this is still uh, nothing TypeScript specific. It's still JavaScript. So will this run? Well, let's find out. Because if I click on this run uh, method and I open the console, and I will say, okay, there's a type error. Uh, I cannot read property to lower of undefined. And of course, this is a runtime error that's given to me by the JavaScript uh, runtime. So what if we want to prevent this? Well, we should add more types to our uh, code. So the compiler can help us find the, uh, the error. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add just a single type here to this parameter. And I'm going to say, I know that this is going to be an array of anything. And we'll, we'll, we'll make this more precise uh, in a second. But for now, let's just incrementally uh, see what happens. And now what happens is that uh, the compiler finds another error. It says, okay, name does not exist on a value of type number. So why would value be of type number? Well, because we said that elms is an uh, array the compiler can trace that all the way through to this for each call and it can show us that okay for each uh, which is part of the standard library of JavaScript defined on an array actually takes a callback function that has as first parameter a value of type any and a second parameter an index so whoops I made a mistake there I swapped them around so let's change this and let's say we have a value here and the index here. Okay, my error is gone, but does that mean that my code actually runs? Let's try it again. Here we go. I'm going to open the console again, and still there is an error. It says undefined is not a function, which really isn't a very helpful error message. Uh, and actually, this, this happens a lot when you're doing a JavaScript development. Um, can we be more precise about what we want to uh, expose as type here? Well, it turns out that we can. And for that, I'm going to introduce an interface. And of course, interfaces are not part of JavaScript. They're a TypeScript feature. So I'm going to say I have this interface called language, and it has a field name of type string, and it has a field extension of type string as well. And now we're going to say this array of elements that we're passing here is not just an array of anything, it's actually an array of language objects. And before we move to the error that is uh, now found by the compiler again, um, let's talk a bit about this interface. 
Because in Java, when we have an interface, uh, if an object has uh, implements an interface, it has to say so, right? It ha you have to say implements this or this interface. Well, in TypeScript, that's not the case. In TypeScript, um, an object actually implements an, in an interface when it is structurally uh, the same as the interface de definition. So even though these objects are just defined in line without saying that they implement uh, this language interface, uh, implicitly they implement the interface because the actual members of the interface match the actual members of the objects here. So TypeScript now knows that, okay, if I accept an array of languages here, then this, uh, then this uh, set that I defined here conforms to this, uh, this interface. So interfaces are structural rather than nominal, like they are in Java. So let's go to this, uh, this error that's now defined. And it says, okay, the property to lower does not exist on the value of type string. And indeed, this makes sense because we're iterating all, over all of these languages and language has a uh, name field, which is a string. And it says there's no to lower method on a string. So what methods are there? Well, because the uh, TypeScript environment and compiler knows everything about strings, it knows uh, enough to give me some uh, autocompletion here and I can actually select to lower case. So it wasn't to lower, but it was called to lower case. So let me add another type here to uh, the first argument of my uh, function. And of course, in this position, we also need to change the to lower to to lower case. Now, will this code run? I certainly do hope so. So let's uh, find out and show the results in a bit of a different way. Uh, the TypeScript compiler also knows about the DOM, uh, the document object model APIs of the browser. So in this case, if I do document dot, it knows about everything uh, that's on documents. So in this case, I'm interested in the body attribute of the document, and I'm in interested in setting the inner HTML of the body. And what I'm going to do there is I'm going to uh, call json.stringify, which is also part of the uh, Java standard, uh, JavaScript uh, standard library. And I'm going to call that on the result. So on the resulting elements that I'm going to find. And that will be printed in the body of the uh, uh, resulting uh, page. So I'm going to run this code again. And indeed, let me make it a little bit bigger. Well, that's not going to work. Anyway, in the upper left, uh, in the upper left corner, there's a uh, stringified version of this uh, object that I uh, that we just found in the array, and there are no errors anymore. So this illustrates how you can take existing JavaScript and by incrementally adding type annotations to it, you can find more and more problems at compile time. And we've also seen that uh, if you have TypeScript, if you have types, the IDE and the compiler can actually help you um, by giving autocompletion and other, uh, other very nice help during development. So before I'm going to switch back to my uh, slides, I'm going to check and see if there are any questions in the Q&A uh, section. So there's a question uh, about uh, IDEs for TypeScript. Do you need to pay uh, to use an IDE for TypeScript? Uh, I'll get to the tooling section uh, in a bit later, but uh, there are uh, plugins for, for example, Eclipse to use TypeScript. Uh, there are free options there, and there are also, there are also paid options uh, for TypeScript as well. So it's a bit of both. Um, the drawbacks of using TypeScript um, Again, I think we'll get back to that in the discussion at the end. Um, there's a question about uh, whether Java enumerations can map to, uh, to something in TypeScript. And yes, TypeScript also has uh, enums as a part of the language. Uh, and they're actually quite similar to Java enums um, in that you just define several values and you can just use them as a sort of a static, uh, static values 
in your code. Can we create functions with a variable a number of parameters uh, in, uh, in TypeScript is another question. Um, yes, that is possible. You have uh, a concept of uh, var arcs, just like you have in, uh, in uh, Java, only you have to be explicit about it, like we saw in the uh, example that I gave. Um, you cannot just uh, call a method with uh, less parameters than, uh, than they're in the definition, you will have to be explicit about uh, the variable arguments uh, like you do in JavaScript. Um, I see a lot of questions that will be answered in the later part of this uh, presentation as well. So um, my suggestion is that I'm going to proceed uh, for now and I'll uh, get back in a bit to the questions and uh, see how we fare then. So these interfaces, what are they useful for? Well, um, we use them a lot to actually type uh, whatever data is coming back from uh, RESTful JSON backend calls. So here's a, just a slight example of that. Uh, let's say that we have a backend call to some user endpoint with an ID, and um, using jQuery API, it gives back a promise in which we get a callback with data, and we can actually type this data with an interface. And now, um, if we use this user variable inside the body of this uh, callback method, we have all the information available about what is a user, what fields are on there. For example, this details field that we uh, see here. But it can be more elaborate, of course. So that's one uh, big use case. And of course, you can use them just like you would with uh, with with Java. With Java, so just to uh, create a generic abstraction uh, across different uh, types of data. Now, what does this buy you? It does this buy you the same thing as it does in Java? You get a separate separation of concerns between different parts of your code. You can code to an interface instead of to an implementation, and you get compiled and checking of whatever you uh, ask of this object. Uh, is actually conforming to the interface that you defined. Now we've seen an example where I just started adding types to existing JavaScript. You could also say, um, if you're going to use TypeScript, I want to go all the way. I want to have my code to be fully typed. This does, of course, uh, exclude some sort of uses uh, of JavaScript that are perfectly valid in JavaScript, but are not valid in TypeScript then. And an example uh, is given here. So let's say I have a declaration of a variable called ambiguous type, and I'm going to assign uh, the number one first, and then in the next line, I'm going to uh, assign a string to the same variable, which again is legal JavaScript. It's also legal TypeScript, because it will just infer that the type of this ambiguous type uh, is any. Now, if this is not what you want, then you can add a flag to the TypeScript compiler invocation, which is called no implicit any. And once you add this flag, what happens is that the compiler will uh, start complaining when it infers that some variable has to type any. And in this case, the error message that you will see is that um, variable ambiguous type implicitly has the any type. So how could you solve this? Well, there are two ways, of course. Um, one is to just explicitly um, add the any type annotation to the ambiguous type variable declaration. And in that case, it still has to type any, but it's not implicit anymore. You explicitly instructed it to be of type any. Or you could say, my, my variables in my code should have a precise type and not any. So either the first line or the second line has to be changed so that they're compatible with each other. So they lead to the same uh, precise type. Now, this is not really feasible if you start with a large JavaScript code base and you just start using TypeScript. If you then enable this flag, you will really, really get a lot of warnings and errors. So this is sort of the goal to work towards. If you can enable this flag on your code base, it means you've thought of all, uh, all the cases and, and you have uh, all the typing in your uh, code is covered. Now, if you have interfaces, you might also want to do I also have classes. Yes, TypeScript has classes as well. And they're similar in some ways to uh, the classes that we have in Java, but there are also some uh, differences. 
first of all, these classes can actually explicitly implement in interfaces. So whereas uh, you do not have to declare that uh, objects implement interfaces in a TypeScript like I've shown, uh, you can do that and it can help uh, in checking whether the class actually has the right members and methods. Classes can in inherit from each other and this is not uh, the prototypical inheritance that we are used to in JavaScript by default, but it's actually a sort of an encoding of the inheritance that we know in Java on top of JavaScript. Classes can have methods and members just like they do in Java, and they can also have uh, not just instance members and methods, but also static members and methods. Like I said, there are some differences as well. Uh, the first one being that uh, uh, a class in TypeScript can only have a single constructor, and this has a lot to do with um, how TypeScript actually encodes these classes in, into JavaScript. Now, TypeScript, and this isn't strictly re related to classes, but on methods in classes and methods in general, functions in general in TypeScript, you can have uh, default values and you can also have uh, optional parameters, either with a default value or without a default value. One of the most important things for me about classes in TypeScript is that they align with the ECMAScript 6 class syntax. So when, uh, when you actually write these classes, you're actually writing classes like you would in the next version of JavaScript. So let's get back to uh, the browser again <coughs> and go to the TypeScript playground once more and check out classes in TypeScript. So instead of the interface, we now have class. And whereas the interface didn't result in any generated code, because it's just compile time uh, checking that's done using interfaces, a class can be instantiated and of course needs to be emitted in the code, in the JavaScript on the right hand side. So what we see here is this uh, immediately invoked function expression pattern that's used, and inside of this, uh, a, fu a function concept is defined, which is a, a constructor function in uh, JavaScript. But as you can see, these fields, they're declared, artists of type string and tickets of type number, but they're not actually emitted in the code yet. And that's because this is just a signature, right? It's only types, it's no, not uh, executable code. But when we initialize this field, and it should of course be a string, as the compiler rightly uh, turns, uh, shows me. So let's say we have an artist, Sting. Then you can see that this uh, assignment turns up in the constructor function that's generated in the um, output. And the nice thing about this is that this class pattern is actually fairly well known in the JavaScript community. But in this case, we actually have a really nice syntax instead of having to uh, type this all by hand. Now, these fields are public by default, as you can see. I instantiate this concert and I just assign uh, values to the members. But that's not really what we uh, typically do in uh, Java. In Java, we uh, often work with a constructor that takes the methods, uh, takes the arguments, and private uh, members. So we also have the private modifier in TypeScript, and now. It shows us that we cannot do this anymore because we cannot just assign to these fields. And for that, we can take the class and add a constructor. And in this case, the constructor can take an argument of type string and the tickets of type number. And we can do the assignment right here this artist is artist, and this dot tickets is tickets. And of course, the instantiation now needs the arguments directly as constructor arguments, so let's do that. And the compiler is happy again. Now, there's also a shortcut. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, how you can achieve this, because this is a very um, uh, 
of an occurring pattern. So what you can also do is add either a private or a public modifier in the constructor of your TypeScript classes. And what happens is that you do not have to do this assignment by hand anymore. And as you can see, the code generated is still the same as that we have when, uh, when we have uh, the explicit assignment. And in this way, you have a fairly concise way of defining uh, your classes. So, what about methods? What if we, for example, wanted to add a buy tickets method with an amount, for example, of type number? So what we could do is uh, we could check that if the amount is less than or equal to the amount of tickets available, then we could. Oh, and here is a trick that I keep falling into. In Java, you can of course re uh, refer to member variables without using the this prefix. In TypeScript, you always have to use the this prefix to access members on your class. So, in this case, uh, we could say this dot tickets minus is amount. Else, throw new error. Not enough tickets. So if we try this on the concert that we created, we can say concert buy tickets, and again it auto completes for me. It knows about the method. It knows that the next argument has to be a number, which is an amount. So we have 50 tickets available, so let's buy 49, and then in the second call uh, buy two, and let's print a little bit console.log bought tickets for the given amount. And if we run this code, and I'll open up the console again, then, like expected, we get the first uh, print line, and then we get an error because there are not enough tickets. We also talked about inheritance in classes. And before we move on to that, um, I just wanted to highlight that, again, this uh, construction that you see here is a fairly well-known idiom on how to encode classes in JavaScript. If I were to give this to an experienced JavaScript developer, he would know the pattern, he would uh, know that this is uh, an encoding of a, a class. Now, this extends to inheritance as well. So we can say we have a class rock concert. And in this rock concert, for example, we add a volume uh, of type number, it goes to 11. And as you can see here, nothing happens yet. And if we let it extend the concert class that we have, there's a little uh, initialization dance going on here inside of this class where we pass in the constructor function of the uh, concert class that we already created and that's used using a special extends function. And this is the only time that the TypeScript compiler emits a little bit of utility code into your output because this extends function is not part of the JavaScript standard library, but this is used to copy all the properties of the concert class to uh, instances of the rock concert class. So we can still use the same constructor, in this case rock concert, and we can now also access the volume uh, that's uh, in our rock concert class. What you can also do is you can override methods in superclasses. So if we were to override buy tickets, we can, for example, say, okay, we have to buy tickets again with an amount number. And uh, let's say we want to check that the amount modulo 2 needs not equal to zero. So then we want to throw an error by in pairs and 
And otherwise, we just want to call the super dot buy tickets implementation with the amount that we've given. Now, if we were to buy two tickets, that should succeed. And if we want to buy one ticket, then we should see the error in the subclass as defined in the rock concept. So let's try that. Let's run the code. And indeed, we can buy two tickets, but when we try to buy one ticket, uh, we see the logic triggered inside of the sub method, in the subclass method. So as you can see, the amount of code is not that much bigger uh, in the output, so there's a fairly easy correspondence, but the syntax is so much cleaner to uh, define classes like this in TypeScript. And this is a, this is a huge win, uh, even apart from uh, having the types available at all for checking. Just the syntax is, uh, in my opinion, so much nicer than having this uh, yeah, sort of monstrosity encoded into your JavaScript, even though it's a very popular and well-known pattern. So I'm going to switch back again to the presentation and check out some of the questions. There's a question, do you know about web frameworks which were developed with the help of TypeScript, like Angular Dart? Um, I don't know about particular web frameworks that have been developed using TypeScript, but you can actually use Angular with TypeScript uh, very easily. And in the um, repository that's uh, on the slide here, so the link that uh, goes to the repository, this, there's an example of uh, using Angular and TypeScript uh, together. Uh, the, there's also a question whether TypeScript uh, supports annotations, uh, like Dart does. Uh, not, not that I'm aware of. Uh, can we create immutable classes in TypeScript? Um, there's no uh, language level support uh, like you have in Java with Final. So if you were to do that, you would have to make sure yourself that you have private fields and that they're somehow not able to be mutated from the outside. Is there a package manager uh, for TypeScript like npm and Bower to JavaScript? Um, it's actually quite an interesting question because that assumes that if you want to use uh, libraries that you would use TypeScript libraries. But with TypeScript you can actually use existing JavaScript libraries and so you can still use uh, package managers like npm and Bower to, uh, to get in external dependencies. And in the last example that I'm going to give, I'm going to uh, show how you can integrate, for example, jQuery, just as a JavaScript library in TypeScript. Are there any static analyzers for TypeScript? It's uh, one of the questions. Uh, yes, there's uh, TSLint, which is doing the same as JSLint, only for TypeScript. What would happen uh, to the generated JS code when you extend from extended classes? For example, a hardware concept extends rock concept, which has one more field. Well, I'd say let's find out because that should be easily doable. So let's create a class hard rock concert extends rock concert. And let's add some fields with some value. And if we look in the output, then we can see that we have a hardware concert. And again, it extends uh, uh, the rock concert that is passed in here, the constructor function. And it actually just puts the some fields on this uh, hard work constructor, hard work concept constructor function. So that, that's just recursively applying the same pattern as happens between the rock concert and the concert. So I'm going to look at a few last questions. Which browsers support TypeScript? Well, that's a nice thing. You don't need explicit browser support to use TypeScript because it compiles down to uh, either uh, ECMAScript 3 or 5, which is uh, just JavaScript supported by all browsers. So 
there are some more questions about jQuery and actually we're going to uh, look at an example of TypeScript and jQuery in a bit, so stay tuned. And there's a question, what's the best way to debug, debug TypeScript uh, in your experience? Uh, you can actually create source maps using the TypeScript compiler and I often use Chrome to, uh, to do debugging and that works fairly well. So let's get back to, to the presentation once more. So th this is about how to use uh, existing JavaScript libraries with TypeScript. How would you do that? Because of course um, TypeScript doesn't know about the types that are inside of these uh, JavaScript libraries. We could take the easy way out and say okay then just anything that is not TypeScript that's coming in has to type any and for that there's a feature called an ambient de declaration where you sort of say okay I promise to you TypeScript compiler there will be uh, a variable with this name for example in scope and it has this and this type and you can do that but it's, that's of course not very nice because you really want to have type information of whatever is inside this library as well um, and this is possible even if it isn't uh, originally a TypeScript library because you can use so-called type definitions. Uh, the most uh, visible example of this is, is called the lib.d.ts, which is the uh, type definition that is bundled with the TypeScript compiler, and that contains all of the knowledge about, for example, the document object model that I've shown uh, earlier, and all the built-in JavaScript libraries. So that's one example of where uh, the TypeScript TypeScript compiler uses these uh, type definitions, but there are also um, type definitions for all uh, popular projects in the JavaScript world. And that's on a website called definitelytyped.org, which is a community effort to uh, create type definitions for popular JavaScript libraries. And I'll give an example of how to use the uh, jQuery type definition uh, a bit later. There's one more feature that, want, that I want to talk about that is in TypeScript that's really helpful to uh, large-scale development. We've seen classes, we've seen interfaces, and we can re relate to those at the, uh, because we know them from Java. Um, there's a last feature uh, called modules added in TypeScript. And there are two flavors, so to say, of these modules. They have uh, what they call internal modules and these are sort of similar to uh, the namespacing that you can do in for example C sharp or other languages it's sort of similar to packages in Java, in Java but not not quite the same and there's also the notion of external modules that you can uh, emit from TypeScript and these are modules that you can use uh, in conjunction with module systems for JavaScript like CommonJS and CommonJS is very popular in the Node.js world, so the server-side JavaScript world. Or um, you can uh, emit uh, asynchronous model definitions, AMD, which you can use, for example, in combination with RequireJS. And that's what we use in our uh, um, clients. So there's one demo, one last demo that I, wanted to, I want to give you and that uh, sort of puts together all the things that we talked about. So let's, in this case, move to a proper IDE and not the playground anymore. So I'm going to show you how you can develop uh, TypeScript using IntelliJ. Uh, you can also use WebStorm, uh, which is a, sort of the web version of uh, IntelliJ. And what I'm going to show is uh, a very small application in which we can, and uh, let me quickly show it, in which we want to uh, show concerts and then when I click on one of these concerts I want to see the details of the concert in my screen. Now let's do this the proper way. So not just one big JavaScript file but we want to have a clear separation between our uh, model view and a controller. So I'm going to create a new file. Let's call this uh, concert service.ts. And 
this will represent my, my model and my communication with uh, the backend. So I'm going to use an inter internal module that I talked about, in this case module concert. And as you can see, um, in the background, IntelliJ is compiling the TypeScript for me, and it shows also the output JavaScript, which is still nothing because it's just an empty module definition, but it will get there. So it's a very nice integration uh, for, for TypeScript in uh, IntelliJ. So I pre-cooked some of my model interfaces here, just to not have to type too much. And what we see here is that I can modify an interface by saying, okay, export this interface to make this visible to the outside consumers of this concert module. This is actually a really nice concept because in JavaScript in general, everything is on the global scope unless you nest it somehow in a function scope. And this is just a very, very nice way to uh, control what is visible outside of a module and inside of a module. I'm also going to um, create a class which is the concert uh, service. And this class contains a method to get an overview of the concerts. And it should return something like probably an array of the concert summary type. So for now, let's say return undefined to make the compiler happy. Um, how are we going to do this? I want to use jQuery, for example, to do my backend call. Now, what I talked about is I could do an ambient declaration. So I could say, well, at runtime, there is going to be some variable called dollar, and it is of type, well, I don't really know, so it's any. And then I can just start using this uh, method, uh, this uh, variable here. But of course, I don't get any meaningful autocompletion on that. So, the other alternative is to try and look up a type definition for jQuery. So, for this, I'm going to go to my uh, terminal and I'm going to use a little tool called the TypeScript Definition Manager, which is also just a node package that you can install, TSD. And I'm going to find the jQuery package and I'm going to install it into the current directory. I could also go to the Definitely Typed uh, website and download it myself, but this is of course much nicer. So now if I go back to um, my IDE, I can see that this typings directory has been added and there's a jQuery type def definition file, which is a very, very, very big file, which contains all kinds of uh, interface definitions for jQuery. In this case, jQuery callback, uh, jQuery promise, and whatever. Uh, I'm just glad that I didn't have to figure this out on my own. So what I can do now is I'm going to reference this type definition. I'm going to do that using the following syntax. Typings jQuery jQuery.d.ts and what this tells to the um, compiler is that it's okay to look inside of this file for any uh, ambient declarations and any type declarations. So now if I'm using this dollar, I actually get autocompletion on all of the methods that are available in, uh, in uh, jQuery. So for example, using getJSON, and notice how it also gives me a signature of the method, very convenient, otherwise I would have to go to the jQuery website, read the documentation, or even read the source code, and what's going on. In this case, I just see, okay, I need to provide a URL, and in this case, I just simply have a data directory with uh, several files in there. And the question now is, what am I going to return from this method? Because this getJSON method actually uh, returns a uh, jQuery promise. I can find that by clicking through to the implementation here. And I can see uh, the, whole, uh, uh, the whole typing of this, uh, this method. But um, I actually want to uh, have these concept summaries. And 
you see this often in JavaScript with the whole uh, asynchronous uh, uh, asynchronous implementation of uh, methods. And in this case, I'm just going to say, okay, let's just return a jQuery promise from this service method in which we are going to return a concert summary. Now, there's also a feature here that you haven't seen before. That's uh, the fact that uh, TypeScript supports generic generics, just like Java does. So this promise contains, ultimately, uh, the list of concert summaries. And, of course, we still need to return from this method. And what we can do now, just quickly, is instantiate this class from outside of the module, call the method, and then we get a jQuery promise, which of course can be handled using a callback method. And in this callback method, I can say, okay, what I get here are the concerts. And what you see here also is a shorthand uh, syntax for uh, inline uh, functions, which is also a TypeScript feature, but will also be part of the next version of JavaScript, so you can already use it if you use uh, TypeScript. And let's just log the concerts to the console in the callback. Now, of course, I still need to add my JavaScript file to my HTML file. And in this case, it's just the concert service.js. Thank you, IntelliJ. And let's go back to the browser. Reload it and look at our console. And indeed, there are two objects in there that are the summary of my concerts that are returned in this call. So we have a sort of working uh, service module, but now we of course need some view and some controller to actually act on uh, whatever is uh, is necessary. So. We won't do that in the same file because we want to separate concerns and we want to show how you can uh, modular, in a modular fashion create this application. So we're going to create a new file called the concert controller, which is responsible for instantiating the service and doing the first call when the page is loaded. So let's do that in a different module. So the names won't clash even if we were to use the same names here. And inside this module, we can instantiate the service. But of course, we need a reference to this module that we just defined. So again, what we're going to do here is we're going to tell the TypeScript compiler that it's okay to uh, reference the concert service.ts in this case, which contains the definition of our concert service. And we're going to instantiate the concert service class so it can be used privately inside of this concert controller. Because as you can see, I do not have the export keyword here. So whatever I do here remains inside of the concert controller module. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a fairly well-known pattern. We're going to do the document.ready call of jQuery, which is called when the page is loaded which takes a callback function, and again, we can use the shorthand function syntax for that. And once the callback uh, has been done, it's safe to call the concert service, and we call the get uh, concert method on that. And We still need to handle the, uh, the promise there, like we did uh, in our little example in the other file. And now what happens is that we have these concerts, but of course, as, uh, as we are a controller, we're not going to do uh, the rendering ourselves. So we're going to delegate that to the concert view, which we still have to create. So let's say render concerts, and then we pass in the concerts we retrieve from the backend. Now we still have to uh, implement this concert view. 
uh, as IntelliJ already saw for us because it doesn't exist. And again, this is a compile time error. You will not uh, find, find out about it uh, only at runtime. And the IDE and the TypeScript compiler in this case helps you with that. So let's create the last file, conserveview.ts. And module concert view. And since we're going to call back into the controller later, I'm going to add a reference to the controller here. Path is concert controller.ts. And we're going to expose this render concerts um, variable. And it takes concerts of type concerts.concert summary. And once we have these concerts, we can iterate over them. And for each concert, I'm going to do some jQuery magic. So, apologies for not doing this uh, by uh, from, from the top of my head, but so there's just some, some jQuery code to add a concert to the uh, concerts uh, div that's in the HTML. Now, it seems that everything is in place. We have our backend call, we have our controller, which is the initial call, and we have our view that renders. Now all that's uh, left to do is to add the compiled JavaScript files to the index. Concert view and the concert controller.js. And let's see how that goes. And indeed, we have the two concepts from the summaries that we retrieved are added to this uh, nice bar. But still, nothing happens, of course, when I click on them. So that's something we still need to implement. And for that, we're going to do uh, sort of the same route that we took for the, uh, the overview of the concepts. For this, we need to extend our service class with a method getConcert, and it takes an ID of type string. And it returns a jQuery promise of type concert, because in this case we have the concert with the full details. So we're going to return again a get JSON call, but in this case we're going to return the concert by ID. So it's just as simple as this. And of course, I have flat files now, but this is just, uh, can just as well talk to a Java backend or whatever RESTful backend uh, that you have. Now, in our controller, we want to um, actually make sure that we have a function to select the new concert. And what still needs to happen here is that I need to add a reference to my view, which I didn't do. And then, as you saw, IntelliJ warned me about this, but even though there was an error in the code, uh, the TypeScript code still compiles to JavaScript. And um, I sort of uh, skirted around this, but what happens is that uh, the compiler couldn't find uh, this definition, but it said, oh well, I'll compile it anyway if you think it's right. So it's sort of like having this ambient uh, type declaration. Uh, you can configure that in IntelliJ to, uh, to also not do that. But in this case, I want to have a method select concert on my controller, which again takes the ID and I'm slightly mixing up things here because I want to do it in the same way that I did on the view. So it's a variable, which is actually a inline function which takes an ID, and once we have this ID, we can call on our concert service instance the get concert method, and 
and then we get a callback with a single concert and we can delegate again to our view to render this concert and we pass the concert to this render method and as you can see, I can use code navigation, etc. in uh, IntelliJ. It knows about all the types and where they live. So we still need to add a render concert implementation here, which takes the actual concert. And again, I've prepared some uh, jQuery magic to actually... Oh, wrong one jQuery uh, magic to do the rendering for me. There we go. And there's one piece of the puzzle missing now uh, because uh, I have everything in place to execute my call. I have a controller method to do the selection from, uh, from the UI, but I still need to handle a click on the nodes that I'm adding here. And so for this, I can do uh, this using jQuery in my view as well. Now this concert node has uh, auto-completion as well because we still have the type definitions from, J from jQuery in here and each element in jQuery has an on method and we can react to the click and then we still need to provide a callback method uh, which defines what to do on this click and what needs to happen there is that we uh, need to inspect uh, our event, which is of type jQuery event object, which is all in, inside of these type definitions. So you can just jump to the definition of uh, on and see that it's uh, that is there. Um, and now all we need to do is uh, find out what the ID is. Uh, so we have a variable ID of type string is event and get. As you can see, I'm very happy with the fact that uh, we have all these type definitions so I can find the method that I need. In this case, I need to delegate target and I need to get an attribute from this DOM node because I setting, I'm setting the ID here so I can retrieve it here as well. And we want to invoke the concert controller where we had this select concert method and we're just going to pass in the ID that we just retrieved from the uh, uh, from the uh, element that was clicked on. So let's go back to the browser, let's reload and see and yes, there it is, we click on the first concert, there it is we click on the second concert, there it is as well. Now, I think this is a very powerful example of what TypeScript can do for you, both in terms of modularity, in terms of productivity. If you look at uh, all the uh, compile time errors that I found, you cannot just make a typo. Uh, you will get a warning from the compiler and you will be uh, warned just before you start running your code. I've also created uh, an AngularJS implementation of exactly the same uh, little application, also using TypeScript, which you can check out at the same uh, URL. So let me just quickly get back to the slides to wrap it up. As I said, we use TypeScript, Angular and require, uh, RequireJS uh, in combination and it's really a great stack. It's really nice to do um, modular, scalable, and uh, productive development on the client side. So check out uh, the URL that I will also give at the end of the presentation, and you will see an example of, uh, of this stack as well. So about the tooling, we've seen IntelliJ. Obviously, since it's a Microsoft project, uh, Visual Studio does support TypeScript as well. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, all of us are not really in the target, um, target audience for Visual Studio. So it's more interesting to know that there's also an Eclipse plugin and this Eclipse plugin um, uh, can be just downloaded from the Eclipse marketplace and you get 
sort of the same features that I've shown in uh, TypeScript uh, uh, extension of IntelliJ and WebStorm. So what about the alternatives? There's of course uh, CoffeeScript, which predates TypeScript and is sort of similar because it also has classes and uh, some of the features that I've shown um, in TypeScript. It's also a compiled to JavaScript language without any uh, runtime library, as far as I know, uh, necessary. Um, the point is that CoffeeScript um, does have a little bit more of these uh, syntactic sugar things, but it still lacks the type system that TypeScript has. And the TypeScript type system and the compiler uh, are the main feature for me. Uh, they really help you catch so much errors and help you, uh, yeah, just see what's happening directly inside of your IDE. And uh, that's just uh, um, uh, not so much possible using uh, JavaScript, uh, sorry, CoffeeScript. Also, if you want to do CoffeeScript, it's not just like you can take your existing JavaScript and rename it, rename it to CoffeeScript files because it's not a valid superset of uh, JavaScript like TypeScript is. And that makes adopting CoffeeScript a bit more of an all or nothing affair. Whereas with TypeScript, you can just gradually uh, uh, adopt it if you want to. And it's a language without a formal specification. Uh, TypeScript does have, have, have a very good one. And like I said in the beginning, there are some really bright guys working on, uh, on TypeScript. And CoffeeScript in that sense seems a bit more, um, well, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's more amateurish, but it it's, seems less professional to me. And also, if you look at the future, uh, CoffeeScript will always be a very different language, whereas TypeScript, uh, yeah, a lot of the features that are in there, the classes, the shorthand function syntax, etc., these are all going to be part of the next version of JavaScript. And that's just not, just not the case for, uh, for CoffeeScript. It's even uh, rumored that maybe the optional typing will be part of the next, next version of uh, JavaScript. So not ES6, but ES7. Then there's also Dart, which is a project by Google, um, which tries to solve a lot of the same problems, uh, but in a different way. And what you see there is Dart is also a very, very, very different language than JavaScript. So you cannot uh, uh, just as seamlessly interoperate with existing uh, JavaScript libraries. Dart also needs its own runtime library to be uh, available alongside your code that you've uh, uh, written in Dart. And there's two options for running Dart, right? You have a specialized Dart VM, which is only available in Chrome, as far as I know, or you can compile it to JavaScript. Um, that's more similar to what you do with TypeScript. But the code that comes out of uh, Dart, um, yeah, isn't that uh, clean. Uh, that there's a reason for that, of course, because uh, Dart as a language does much more and it uh, deviates much more from uh, from JavaScript. So there's a reason for that, but it's a de deliberate choice that you have to make. And also, um, yeah, it's really the choice of whether you want to be uh, tied to this to this ecosystem created by uh, by Google. And they have Angular Dart and they have really nice uh, things on top of Dart. But the question is. Um, is the JavaScript, JavaScript space as a whole. Um, is that going to move towards Dart or not? And I believe that's not the case. And with TypeScript, um, you won't be the victim of that because you're just fully interoperable with uh, JavaScript. And uh, in Dart, yeah, it's just sort of a more of a closed ecosystem that you're choosing. So in conclusion, for us, at migration from uh, yeah, just JavaScript without uh, a lot of uh, separation of concerns, without a lot of modularity, towards a more modular and scalable development model. Uh, model. You could start with just some typing somewhere in some files, like I did in the first example, and using maybe internal modules to namespace and to separate things from each other. Uh, start using the classes and interfaces. And then if you move on on the adoption curve of TypeScript, you can uh, start looking at using these external type definitions, using AMD or CommonJS modules, um, uh, add even more typing uh, to your code. And in the end, of course, uh, it would be very nice if you could end up in a situation where all of your code is explicitly typed and you can enable the uh, no implicit any flag 
of uh, TypeScript. So are there downsides to TypeScript? Yes, of course. Um, it's still very close to JavaScript. Um, there's no completely different semantics like you have with Dart, for example. So that also means that TypeScript cannot fix a lot of quirks that are in JavaScript, mainly having to do with the JavaScript standard library or having to do with uh, all kinds of quirky uh, type comparisons and uh, unexpected things there. You still need to know about that. So um, in that sense, it's not that far from JavaScript. Also, the current compiler isn't the fastest, although there's a 1.1 release coming up, which is actually three or four times faster, so I'm really looking forward to that. But as a workaround, um, we use, uh, for example, Gulp as a build system. You can also use Grunt, which is also a popular JavaScript build system to, do, to configure incremental builds. So it won't recompile your whole code base on any change, but just uh, the files that changed. And one thing that's uh, really bugging me about uh, the whole module thing in TypeScript is that the uh, syntax for external modules, which I have not shown, but it's in the examples in the repository uh, at the URL that I will show at the end, uh, this module syntax is, is not yet aligned with ES6. And uh, the TypeScript, TypeScript guys promised that it will be, so they're working on that. But that's uh, something uh, that, uh, that should be uh, better. And also, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, the Visual Studio tooling is, I think, uh, still ahead of the third-party tooling around uh, TypeScript, even though uh, IntelliJ, I'm using it daily, and it's uh, getting better and better, and it's, it ha it's helping me a lot already. Um, but yeah, since Microsoft obviously is the steward of the project, they have sort of a, an edge on their tooling. So to, uh, to wrap this up, in short, uh, TypeScript has been a high value and very low cost because it can be incrementally done uh, improvement over uh, our existing JavaScript practices. And it allowed us to have a more safe and, and modular environment to create our uh, clients in. And on the face of it, it also gives you a really nice and solid path to using the new features in um, ECMAScript 6, like classes, they will be in there, the shorthand function syntax, and, and modules, etc. These will all be part of ES6, and we can already use them. And TypeScript is committed to be uh, aligned with ES6 also in the final specifications when they come out for ES6. So that's it for me. I'm going to look if there are any questions anymore, but um, uh, here are the links that are relevant. The code can be found at this uh, bit.ly link slash tscode. And if you want to learn more about TypeScript, there's a really nice handbook at typescriptlang.org slash handbook. And if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A, and you can also reach me on, uh, on Twitter on the at, uh, sender underscore mark handle. So I'm going to close my presentation a bit, and I'm going to look at the Q&A. Um, there's a question about unit testing for uh, TypeScript, uh, whether I can uh, elaborate on that. Um, we are just using uh, JavaScript unit testing libraries with TypeScript code. And since uh, that there are type definitions for, for example, the Jasmine library, which we use for JavaScript unit test, and it all interoperates seamlessly because, uh, yeah, TypeScript and JavaScript are interoperable. So there are no special to uh, toolings um, necessary for doing unit testing. Uh, code covers is not something that I have actually worked with uh, yet, um, but I would imagine that you can just use the uh, same tooling as for JavaScript, and then you would get covers on your JavaScript instead of your TypeScript code, of course. But as I've shown, these two uh, do not diverge that much. So it's probably pretty easy to see if you miss a branch uh, where in the TypeScript uh, you would need to do, uh, do some more uh, testing. Um, there's a question about if there's any experience with using TypeScript in Chrome applications. So uh, I assume you mean uh, building applications for the Chrome store. Um, I personally do not have any uh, applications uh, built in the Chrome store or experience with that. Um, I would have to look that up. Uh, I do not have uh, any points for you on that, sorry. 
Um, let's see if there are any things that I've missed. Can we use jQuery? Well, we've seen that. And is there multiple inheritance? Um, you can inherit from multiple interfaces, like you can in Java, but there's no multiple in implementation inheritance. So it's a, it's a typing thing only. And scrolling back, it seems that I've covered most of the questions. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for the uh, attention and for joining us.